Turn to Acts 23 this evening as we get in here. Um, hallelujah. I think, I think regarding this part of the section, um, I, I could see the end in sight. doesn't mean anything. Um, but uh, I think next week we'll be able to get into the, uh, uh, the plot to try to kill um, Paul in Jerusalem. I mean, what better way to ce- uh, celebrate a festival than kill somebody in cold blood, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, we, we know where we're at. I don't have to go through a lot of it. Uh, sometimes when I'm, um, when I'm teaching, especially if there's somebody that hasn't been here you want to make sure that you really lay the foundation where they know what's going on, where where we're at. Um, but we we know that we're just we're sitting here in uh, in the room uh, where the Sanhedrin meets, seventy one men uh, who meet there to kind of rule uh, over uh, the Jews, and uh, and 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 there. This is not a planned meeting. This is something that was kind of put together quickly, and uh, and and they're they're there to just take care. So there would be a level. Where even though these men do still have uh, festivities and things, that, uh, responsibilities that they have to take care of, it could be a little annoying on their part that they have they're called away from. You know, you, you think about like if you if you're at your job and on Christmas Day or around Christmas time when you're supposed to have a day off, and they're like, everybody come in, we got a we got an important uh, we got some things to cover. You'd be a little bit annoyed, and well, that's kind of what what they're dealing with here. Um, so. So Paul addresses them, gets smacked in the mouth, uh, yells at the high priest, gets corrected by the people around him, right? Uh, so let, let's let's pick it up at verse six, and, and we'll just kind of get a, a re, uh, not. I don't want to deal with a lot of stuff that we've de- we've dealt with, but in verse six it says, "But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee." Of the hope of the resurrection of God, I am called. Uh, okay, let me slow that down. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And when he had, had said so, wow, I got to just slow down here. Okay, I want to. And when he had so said, I could just change transla- translations and be probably equally fine. There arose a dissension among the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, uh, but the Pharisees confess both. Don't want to get too much into that, but we do understand there. All it's saying is that uh, the Sadducees don't believe in angels. They don't believe in demons. They don't believe in the spiritual realm. They, they, don't, they don't believe in life after death. They don't believe any of that. That's why they were Sadducee. Um, and, the, and the Pharisees, they believe that they all existed. They just didn't know about the blood. They didn't know about the victory that they had. And so they were just fair. Uh, And so anyway, um, so verse nine, and when there arose a great cry, the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove saying, we find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken unto him, we shouldn't be fighting against him, which is really kind of a good, a good thing. I, 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 I'm getting, uh, I, I am pretty merciful a lot of times when I, when I deal with stuff on social media because I don't care about social media. I don't like it when people uh, spread false stuff or when they spread whatever, when they, when they think that they sound smart. I don't like it, but I just let it slide. Um, but when people start attacking men of God, um, I, I'm getting a little bit more annoyed about at it. Uh, somebody uh, annoyed, uh, uh, posted um, on Twitter about uh, Stephen Furtick and said, listen to what he says. He says nothing at all. We listen to the crowd. And, and it, basically, basically, um, this little clip, it was, I, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but basically the, the overriding thing was uh, God is able. And he said, I don't care what you're going through. God is able. God is able to take, God is able, God is able, God is able. And I, I saw, I'm sitting there thinking, what is this guy? Why is this guy? Doing this. People are shouting. Now, again, he got excited. He got shouting. He got doing his thing that Stephen Furtick does. Um, but I put on there, I said, so God is not able? Question mark. I said, maybe it's not Furtick that has the problem. Perhaps it's you and the little box that you have your God in. And because I was like, <laughs> and then he answered me and he said, maybe it's your, maybe it's the uh, box you have your God in, or should I say the genie bottle? God is not your genie. And I said, 
And I put Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2, and 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, which says God is more than able. And I said, the good thing about my little box is that I've got the Word of God back in me. And I haven't heard back from him yet. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I, just, I don't get into that kind of stuff, but I'm tired of people beating on people. Because especially when they want to try to pretend that they're spiritual, they're not spiritual. That's what James says over there. He says, you guys that are, that are finding... Oh, let's go over there. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, per se, maybe. I don't know. Um, but I, James... Chapter uh, 3, Hebrews, James. Um, it says, uh, who is a, verse 13, Who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show it out of the good lifestyle, his works with meekness and wisdom. Uh, but if you carry bitter envy, strife in your hearts, where you're, where you're fighting and you're trying to push, you know, go against people, glory not. Don't make it a big deal like you're something spiritual. Lie not against this truth, because truth, because this wisdom is it descendeth not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. Where envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. And and, and the, the the simple point is is that where there's division, God can't work there. And and again, I I I, I I'm fascinated by how often in our in our teaching, like especially on this, where I may kind of like you know go slow on certain parts, and then all of a sudden we'll find ourselves at a time where I'm teaching on covenant relationships and and and, uh, and you know having to be united in covenant in order to come into the promised land. I find ourselves right in the middle of that teaching on the division, like we did last week. And I'm always like, God, you are the planner. You, you know exactly how to uh, set this stuff up. And so, so that's what the, the Holy Spirit understood, that if there could be a division in that group of men, that they would, they would get their eyes off of logical thinking to take uh, Paul down and would start just fighting each other, which is exactly what happened. Uh, well, it, it works the same way with us, beloved. When the enemy can get us, uh, fighting within each other, um, then then our job of winning souls, our job of increase, gets gets distracted, and, and we get messed up. So we've got to keep our hearts in unison. Verse ten, and when there arose, yeah, when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain the one that brought him in, you know, that, that, to start this thing, fearing lest Paul should have been, pulled, uh, have been pulled into pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down to take him by force from among them and bring him, to the ca uh, bring him into the castle. I'm going to stop there just for a second just to, to finish this section up here of the, of the chaos. Because I was reading that and I, and I thought, um, I, I, the, the, the line that I've had typed out for several weeks just to kind of you know, have a concept of, of, of that, point was simply this, that the chief captain recognized their insanity and felt the need to save Paul because they were crazy. That was my, that was my description of what was going on. In other words, this, now, now think about what it is, okay? There's a heathen. He's not Jewish. He's not Christian. He's a heathen. He's a Roman soldier. Uh, he ha he's not spiritual in any way, shape, or form. And, and he recognizes the insanity in the actions of these men. That, that, that a simple statement like resurrection got the place going crazy. <clears throat> and remember, his previous uh, understanding of them was when he said Gentile, and it made him go crazy. And, and, and the thought hit me that, that, you know, people could be converted to Judaism. You, yes, you were born a Jew, yes, but you could always also be converted to Judaism. Now, let's think about this. Let's think if these men were thinking about ministering or trying to convert this Roman uh, soldier uh, into, uh, into Judaism. Um, how quick do you think he would want to be a part of them? No. I mean, would you want to convert to Judaism if you saw that display of insanity? No. And that made me think of just the, of the scriptures that say in John chapter 13, verse 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. 
Are you a good arguer? Do you know enough of the Bible to argue with people? See, I, I don't, I don't, you know, some people are going, Pastor Thad, you just said you argue. I, I, I did. I don't ever do that, but I just, I, I, I was like, I'm tired of people beating the people of God. And, and just because they don't like that they're the same as them. They're not the same as them. Are you a good arguer? Do you have scriptures memorized just to argue with people? Do you, uh, is, that, is, that, is that how you're trying to reach people? Are, are you a person that the, the things you post online are just about um, tearing other people down and, and building up your concepts? That is not what shows people that you're a disciple and how good God is. It's the love of God displayed through your life to them. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. It's love, it's compassion, it's commitment to others, not just to your own thought pattern. uh, Psalm 31 verse 19 out of the New Living Translation says, how great is the goodness that you stored up uh, for us that fear you. You lavish it on those that come to you for protection, blessing them before a watching world. God, the world is watching us. And they will not be changed. They will not be encouraged to be a part of what we're involved in if all we're doing is bickering. If all we're doing is rising up against one another, they're not going to they're not going to want any part of what we have. But if we're loving, if we're showing them the goodness of God, if we're walking in the goodness of God, then all they all know them our disciples, they'll come to the light. Amen. And so I, I don't know, I just, it's just kind of a subtle thing there. But, but uh, no, you don't want to be a part of something with chaos. You want to be part of something with peace. Amen? And so, so, uh, so they took him back to the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for thou hast, test- uh, thou, uh, hast testified of me in Jerusalem. So must thou bear witness also in Rome. Now here's where we're going to spend a lot of time here tonight. I hope we can get, hopefully we can get through it because I really don't want to uh, go beyond uh, today uh, tonight on this um, area. Um, but the night following, the next night, um, the Lord stood by him. Now, now th- there's there's a good chance where where I think it's Matthew 28 where it says, "And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth." And so it is within the realm of possibility that it was an unseen force because that's how most of us would understand the unseen force uh, that the Holy Spirit is with us and is speaking to us. Um, But it's also a very real possibility that God showed up to him. Uh, Maybe it was in a vision, a dream, or maybe it was in person. He just showed up and looked at him and said, be of good cheer because you've been obedient to share the gospel in Jerusalem. Um, I, I, now you've got the responsibility to share it beyond that. Um, so, so we don't, again, how it is, we don't know this, but this much we do know. If God shows up to tell Peter to cheer up, I'm guessing it's not because Peter was really happy that he was doing really well. If God shows up to tell you to cheer up, chances are you're not very cheerful. Amen? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, if if, if he's, if if he says, be of good cheer, Paul, that means Paul probably is not of good cheer. And he was having some problems in that jail cell. He needed some cheering up. So we're going to kind of go through this a little bit. What was the issue? Now again, most of us would stop at the simple fact, well, he was in jail. And he was, he was, there was a bunch of lunatics trying to kill him. Would that not be enough to get you a little bummed out? Um, now this wasn't his first time in jail. He'd been in jail several times. 
Uh, most of them, many of them, he was miraculously delivered. This time he was not. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that in a little bit here. But God knows exactly what you need. He knows where you're at. He knows what you need. And, uh, and he, in the midst of all that chaos going on, here he is in the middle of the night, all, all alone. So that's the issue, that he was in, he's in jail and a bunch of uh, people are wanting to kill him. Crazy people are wanting to kill him. All you have to do is study, all the early disciples had to do was study what they did to Jesus and understand they weren't playing by the rules. Right? So, so they had that to deal with. Uh, the secondly, and again, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of these things, and I think they can all work together, because how many thoughts come to you in the middle of the night when you're fighting a battle? Especially if you're laying there or sitting in the chair and your spouse is sleeping and, you're, and you feel all alone, you feel like they don't, you know, you, you, the devil will even tell you they don't even care. How many different thoughts can come to you that can pile up on you in the middle of the night, in the dark? That's what we find him. And so the first thing we see is that the, he, he, just the fact that these people are after him. Secondly, he just had two really great opportunities that in other locations possibly have worked two levels. We know that in many places, many synagogues that he went into, he wasted his time. We understand that. But many places, that even that we don't see, uh, it would have worked because uh, because Jewish people were getting born again too. So he had two great opportunities. The first one on the steps, the second one in the Sanhedrin, in the in their building, to and and, and to just squarely deliver the word of truth. <laughs> I I think about that sometimes because sometimes I think Pastor Elisa was feeling that a little bit tonight. It was where 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 you know you got the word, you know you've heard from God, you've got it written down. You, it's it's giving you goosebumps already uh, at one point today or whatever, and you're trying to get the words through to words out, but they didn't come. Maybe they came out the way you thought they would, and there wasn't the response, or maybe whatever it is. You you there's times I've got done preaching, and I think, well, I failed that one miserably. People didn't care about it. I, I there's been a lot of my sermons. On Sunday mornings, and and I think sometimes it just can be because of the um, because of the topic of covenant. I felt like have I did I did I come close to bringing that across the way the Holy Spirit was showing me? Did, did they get what? And you could almost feel like a failure at a level because I didn't do I could not get it across to them. And it's and it, unless you've been up here, you you to, to teach and to minister. It's kind of a hard thing to try, really understand because most people would think, "Oh, Pastor Ted just is up there very confidently and very strongly." And Pastor Lisa, she's what is? Why are they? Why, why does Pastor Lisa think that she didn't get across to us? It was really good. I really liked it. I got got the point. I I got. The, and you looking out there, and, but up here the enemy is 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 just focused on to try to get you focused on. Boy, you blew that one. So here he is in the middle of the night. He's got a bunch of people plotting to kill him. I mean, he didn't even know the level of plotting they were they were getting ready to do. Middle of the night, he's got these crazies after him. He's in jail. He's in a jail cell. And, and he's looking and going, I've just blown two magnificent chances. And there's nobody, to have, no, no evidence uh, manifested. Is, is God done with me? Is this it? Or, or, am I am I wasting my time? Amen, amen. Um, but how about this one? I think those first two are very real, because again, the enemy doesn't come at you with just one lie in the middle of the night. He comes with you, comes at you with lie after lie after lie after lie after lie. And, and nighttime is, is the worst. But what about all those words that he received on his way to Jerusalem? What about people begging him, 
oh, we, something horrible is going to happen to you. Remember when he showed up at Tyre and, 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 and they're, going, they're going, something horrible is going to happen to you, Paul. You don't go. Please don't go. Now the prophet showed up and told him exactly what was going to happen. You're going to be bound. But what did everybody else do when they heard that he was going to be bound? Don't go. Something bad is going to happen. You know, you heard what they said. Some best. Don't go. Just stay here. We'll just chill here for a while. We'll have a vacation. We'll go fine. And everything's going to be good. And, and I just, I, you know, in the simplicity of that, because, again, I don't want to take a lot of time on this. But you, we need to guard ourselves. If God speaks to you on behalf of someone else, it is not always for you to share that with that person. I, I've used this illustration many times, but uh, back years ago, um, one of our pastors, um, he would have dreams periodically about people dying. And, and he knew when they were these dreams because, because it, within a, you know, a week usually of him having that, those people would die. And one, one night he woke up in kind of a panic because one of the pastors in our fellowship, he had a dream of his son dying. And it was one of those dreams. And, and, he, was, and he was like freaked out. So the next morning he called my dad and said, what do, I, do I need to go tell him? Do I need to say this? Do I need to do this? Um, what, what do I do? And I don't know because I, these, when I have these dreams, they always come to pass. And my dad said, don't even think about it. He said, all you're going to do is, is, is scare the pastor or scare the, scare the father scare the kid, scare the family, freak them out. He said, God didn't give you these dreams to, uh, to tell you what's going to happen. He's telling you what to pray for. He said, you, just, you start praying for, for that, that young man. You start praying the protection of God. You, you intercede for him. Well, that kid's still alive today, and that was probably 10, 15 years ago. Um, so... Not all the time is it, are we supposed to be just going around. If God speaks something to you, sometimes that's for you just to pray for that person on, to cover that person in prayer. We got to watch the words of our mouth. Because as much as encouragement is good, which it is, encouragement is, is, is very good. When you start speaking words of doubt, if you let's let's say I were to look at Pastor Elisa and just you know maybe she flubbed up up here and she just and I look at her and say, yeah that was not very good you were not very good what's she going to focus on that night when she gets home either Pastor Thad's a jerk or Pastor Thad doesn't think I'm very good are you with me and it's going to add to what's being beat up in her inside of her it's going to be used against her beloved I'm telling you the enemy came to Paul that night. And said, you shouldn't have come. They tried to get you not to come. You came. You're stuck here. You got a bunch of lunatics following you. You messed up. If you, if you would have been called by God, that would have been perfect. And he's, and he's, he's putting in his He's using the words of those people. Those people should not have said that. Amen. Are you following me on this? So we've got to guard our mouths when we, even if you're right, pray for that person. Encourage that person. That's one of the things that I like about, it talks about the, 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 the Christian is at Tyre that, that, had been, that had heard from the Holy Spirit that, that something was bad and they didn't know how it was, but they said something bad is going to happen to you. And they, and they tried to give him their opinion. It's not, it's not the reason. The prophet didn't give him his opinion. Said, here's what's going to happen. And that's exactly what happened. Very well possibly is the same thing that, that God spoke to uh, the Christians. It's just they tried to give their opinion on it. No. Unless God tells you an opinion, it's not your job for an opinion. But I kind of like the, the four virgins, the four uh, Philip's daughters. Where it just says they did prophesy. Which means they encouraged him. All they did was speak over him. God is mighty. God is good. God, is, God will cover you. God will, 
I don't know what they prophesied, but that's what the gift of prophecy is. It's encouragement. Beloved, our job is not necessarily to correct and to, and to condemn people or to, to give whatever, to give them. Our job is to edify them and encourage them in life. So here he is, all alone. Think about this. He had been bold and courageous that morning. Oh, you whitewashed. I mean, he's ready to fight. He's ready to go after it, right? He was bold and courageous. And now it's dark and quiet. Streets are quiet. Everything's quiet. And that's when the enemy spoke. And I'm not going to spend time here because I've already talked about that. And the quietness of that night. When he's alone with his thoughts, the enemy came in and dropped his thoughts in him. And tormented him. And beloved, I'm telling you what, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a prime time for the enemy. To get you where it's quiet. To get you where you're by yourself. To get you where nobody else is there. And just you and your brain. And start putting in thoughts. Putting in thoughts of failure. Putting in thoughts of what's co what could happen. Thoughts of how your children are, 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 are too far gone. Are too messed up. Put in thoughts about how your finances, you're going to fail. Put in thoughts about how your giftings and callings are too far from coming to pass. He'll put in your mind. It's too late. God's done with you. It wouldn't shock me if that lie has been used throughout this congregation recently. Just the fact that my ministry probably is, is am I almost done. Is it? I, I feel like I feel like I'm, I'm I'm working hard. Nothing's happening. My gifting, my calling. You, you, you know. But that's a lie. Jeremiah says, "I know the thoughts." Go over, go over to Jeremiah uh, 29. I know this is a little later in the message here, but that's okay. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, where it says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. And again, again, that little translation is, I know the plans that I have for you. I know the plans that I have set out for you. And then it says, thoughts of shalom, peace, safety, absolute fullness of life, prosperity, not of evil. And then it says to give you an expected end. He knows the thoughts. God knows the thoughts. And, he, and, and his thoughts wasn't for you to fail. His thoughts are not for you to come up short. His thoughts are, you know, no matter what you're currently going through, no matter what, what area you currently feel like you've been shorted in or you, you shorted him in, no matter where you're at currently today, that his plan is for you to succeed. And so if, if you've gotten off and you're, and, you're, and you're messed up simply because you've gotten off, Beloved, all you have to do is get back on and you get back in that plan. Um, I, I have, well, I, I, we all know my, my story about going down to Tennessee um, uh, and, and taking the shortcut. And, 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 as, and as stressed out as we were in that time, we didn't just stop the trip and go home and go, we went off course. We messed up. We went through some weird terrain. We went through some, some, uh, some, we went over a mountain on muddy roads. We didn't quit just because we got back on the road and we took the road to Sevierville, to Pigeon Forge. We got back on the road. Most of you, most of you, if, if I would have told you the story and the story would have ended up, we got back on the main road and just came home. You just said, why didn't you go? Because I got off track. And I just didn't think that I could ever have any fun. I could enjoy myself, which I had trouble that first day. I was beating myself up um, that first day. But I can't, we can't have any more fun. Can't even, I just had to come home because it would, didn't make sense to go any further. Y'all be going, it didn't make sense for you to stop. 
Get on the road, go on down. Don't stop. Beloved, in the darkness, when the light or when the lights come. All right, all right, all right. Um, what is it? It's Psalm 35, I believe. Uh, let's see here. Psalm 30, verse 5. <laughs> I didn't have numbers, right? Um, for his anger endureth for, but for a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. When does the weeping come? When the lies come. And if I'm reading this correctly, it is well within the realm of possibility that there may have been a little bit of weeping going on in that jail cell. And if it wasn't weeping in the flesh with water coming out of his eyes, it was at least an exasperation. Weeping comes in the night. Why? Because that's when the lies come. That's when the enemy comes. But what's our job? Is to find the light. What's the light? The Word. Your Word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. That's the light. And if we will partake of the light, if we will step, in, if we'll step into the light, that's when joy comes. But now here, Paul was alone, but he wasn't alone. Jesus knew exactly where he was. And again, the scripture is in Matthew 28, 20, uh, where, where he says, um, teach, the, uh, teach these new disciples. I think I did this out of the New Living Translation or something like that. But he said, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even until the ends of the word. Put it up there in the King James. So I teach these new disciples, I, yeah, yeah, teaching them to observe all things that who... Uh, Whatsoever I've commanded thee, and lo, I am with thee always, even to the ends of the world. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing, in the midst of that darkness, you can either listen to the lies, but that's exactly where. And I kind of, and I know low is low, like hey yo, you know, you know, it's it's a it's a statement, but in those lowest times, in those times with the enemy, that's where God is with you. Um, there, there was an illustration I read as I was, as I was studying a man named John Bunyan, uh, not Paul, um, but but John was a was a I believe he's the author of the Pilgrim's Progress, and I didn't haven't read it, but um, but he wrote that. But but he he was an imprisoned pastor in England. They they had some time where. Um, I guess if you taught against the church or something like that, I don't know, that they were imprisoning him. And he was in there for like 12 years. And he'd already been in prison for several years. And a man visited him and said, friend, if you, I don't know, has, I don't know if anybody's ever ran into people like this. Uh, but they, friend, the Lord has sent me to you. I've been looking to you, looking for you in all of the prison, in half, what was it? Looking for you in over half the prisons in London. And John Bunyan said, I don't think God sent you at all. Because the Lord knows exactly what prison I've been in the whole time. If God would have sent you, he'd have shown up the right one. See, that's the thing is that the enemy wants to tell you you're all alone because it's dark. Those are the times, go ahead and turn on some worship music, stick your earbuds in, whatever you need to do. But recognize that, that in the quietness, that that's where light, because the quicker you get light on, and I'm, you don't have to, you don't have to, have you ever been through a night where you had a bunch of physical stuff going on? Heartburn, you know, just uh, stress, just pain. Maybe not pain, maybe, well, maybe pain, maybe a migraine, uh, whatever. Je Jessica, um, before she, before they lopped out her gallbladder, um, she would have these days, these nights where she'd wake up in the middle of the night and her gallbladder would just be, 
or, or just be you know, complete pain if anybody's ever felt that, just tor tormenting her. And if she got up and moved, it would ease the pain a little bit. So I would be, it was awesome for the cleanliness of our house. Um, but uh, but I'd, I'd wake up and every now and then, if I, you know, I'll flip over and I'll look and she wasn't there. Or I'd flip over one minute and I'd kind of reach over to that and she wasn't there. And I was like, oh no. But it was always in the middle of the night. She, she, I mean, I don't think she had a lot of these things in the middle of the day. It was in the middle of the night when it was dark. Often I would hear her up there in the middle of the night washing dishes, cleaning the kitchen, and having, um, I, don't, I don't know, someone worship music on. But why? Because she was trying to introduce light into, into that darkness. God the Father shows up exactly where he needed to be for Paul and says, hey, Paul, I'm here. Don't be sad. Be of good cheer. Now, now I, I'm going to deal with that. I'm trying to go in, in order here. I've got 10 minutes left. Um, so, so in the quietness of the night, he's still there. You've got to stop and listen. That's one thing I know we say a lot about God, but God is a gentleman. He's not going to force you to, to yield to his ways. You're going to have to stop and, and welcome him in and, and give him access. Now, here, here's the thing. Paul had been in prison another, other times. Matter of fact, Acts 16, he was in prison with, with Silas in the middle of the night, at midnight, darkness of night, that same time, all of a sudden they began worshiping and they began praising and they began uh, lifting up their voices to God, singing everybody around them heard him. Remember that? And, and, and the earth started rumbling and, and the, their, their, their bands broke and the doors flung open, right? They, 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 they encouraged themselves. They, they built up themselves. And here, he's in a dark cell, fighting. I'm not going to say fighting depression, but fighting heaviness, oppression. What was different? Now, um, I'm, going, I'm going to answer that question here in a second. But most of us would say, Paul. Remember when you were in jail in, in, in uh, uh, Philippia, uh, Ph Philippians, Philippi, thank you. <laughs> Some of those words. Remember when you were in jail and you worshiped? All you need to do is start singing a song and it would have knocked, it, 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 it would have done the same thing. And uh, see, there's a problem with that. Because God doesn't work with formulas. That's one of the things I always try to bring out when we're talking about faith. We're talking about like the woman with the issue of blood. She, she said and she kept saying, if I can touch, but just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. Well, what do we believe? Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and you'll be saved. That he's the author and the, that, 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 uh, that he's the high priest of the confession of faith, profession of faith. That speak it, speak it, speak it, speak it, speak it. Keep speaking it and manifestation will come. We read that story and go, she, she spoke it. She kept speaking it. It was a repetitive thing and it manifested. And so what we can do is we can say, I'm going to mimic what the woman with the issue of blood did and I'm going to use it as a formula. It won't work. I said it 500 times today and it hasn't worked yet. I said it 200 times yesterday. I said it a thousand times this week and it hasn't worked yet because we're trying to, we're trying to take faith and make it a formula and it doesn't work. Faith is a substance. And faith is either inside of you and will work on the outside or it won't. You can't pretend your way into an answer. So here he is in the quietness of this, uh, of this situation and he could have said, oh, it worked before. Let me start singing songs. Now, he could have changed his atmosphere. He could have, but would it have set him free? Would it have worked the same? One of the things I've been thinking about uh, uh, recently more often is, um, 
is the outpouring over in Asbury. And, and uh, um, there was something about it. I, I liked it. I loved it. I want some more of it. But there was something about it that wasn't sitting right with me. And I didn't know. I couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on it. And I would feel guilty that, why am I being bothered by this? Is it a competitive thing? I heard one person say, I think it was Mario Morella, say that some people are, are, you get frustrated with it because you know they've been working, they've been faithful for years in their field, and uh, and, and nothing's like that's happened with them. And I was like, oh, maybe that's me. But as I was watching it, what I was watching was everybody running to it, and. Even people that I, churches, ministries that I, I, I respect, I like, were running to it. And then right after they ran to it, they were running back to their church and saying, we're starting all day worship starting this Monday. We're all going to, we're going to sit in the church. And if you want to come, we're going to have all day worship. We're going to worship all day long and we're going to worship all day long so we can get what they got. Beloved, I'm going to say it like this. I've used the word manipulation, and I do think that, that there's a level where that, that is the best, um, best word. Is you're trying to manipulate God. But a, a word this week that I, I, I was thinking of, and, and again, I didn't, understand, I didn't realize it was going to fit in tonight. I just was like, I don't care. I'm going to need to preach that sometime. Well, here it is. They're trying to bribe God through praise and worship. It's kind of like, hey, here's a little bit of praise and worship for you to come and visit. Yeah, what do you, you need a you need a five spot, you need a ten spot. How about a twenty spot? I'll give you a twenty. Let, let me give you an illustration of this. Let, let's say Pastor Elisa goes to Walmart. I'm making up some of these numbers, okay? But but just stick with me on the on the illustration. Let's say she goes to Walmart and she's and she's going through the checkout line and she looks up at, at this lady that's uh, that's kind of watching over the checkout lines and and uh, and she just feels like she's supposed to give her 20 bucks you know it's not going to break pastor lisa but she's like she's like i just feel like i'm supposed to give this. and she comes up to that lady and she goes give her the lady comes over so i just felt like the holy spirit told me to give this to you and the lady is moved because of because of the love shown and the, and the display shown by and the girl the lady's moved and she's like i've just been thinking because i didn't have any money to eat Anything today? I, I broke. I was going to go home and just sit and and uh, and I maybe had a little box of crackers. I was going to eat. And now I can go out. And she's she's just crying because, and she looks at Pastor Lisa and says, "Will you let me do something for you?" And Pastor Lisa's like, "I don't know." She goes, "No, listen. Uh, I get uh, and I don't know this is I get a fifty percent discount on my groceries. Let me run my card for you." And so that you can get 50% off your groceries. And Pastor Lisa's up there with a whole cart full of stuff. And she's going, praise God. So instead of the $200 bill, she's, she's $100 bill. She's blessed. She comes to church the next week. And she's like, God, so good. He, he, he uh, um, you know, and she shares that story with her. And then Pastor Thad is like going the next day. Because he's like, I, I go there all the time too. And I walk up to this lady and I've got, I've got all this stuff in my cart. And I'm thinking, you know what? So I go over to, you know, I look in somebody and I'm like, here's $20 for you. That's not the love of God moving on my heart. That's me trying to work that person, manipulate that person, bribe that person to get what she got. That was something that God had specifically for that time for Pastor Lisa. She could do it a hundred more times and, it, and that may never happen again. But at that moment, God, she, God knew what she needed. God knew what that lady needed. And they were able to take care of each other. And that's what we end up doing. When we think, well, I'll do what someone else did. You say, well, Pastor Thad, don't we always say that if he's done it once, he'll do it again. If he's done it for one, he'll do it for me or do it for you. Don't you say that? I, absolutely. Because his word works. When you work His Word. Not a formula. Faith is not about confessing something enough. 
It's about getting the Word of God inside of you. Mark chapter 4. You get the Word, get the seed of the Word of God inside of you, let it grow, and it will produce the harvest you need. And when it grows in you, it will, it will change the way you talk. Why? Because inside of you is blooming this life of the Word of God. And so you're not going to be talking lack. You're going to be talking prosperous. You're not going to be talking sickness. You're going to be talking health. You're not going to be talking um, uh, frustration. You're going to be talking joy. Because inside that's what it's doing. It's not a formula. It's the truth. It's a substance. That will work if you, if you grow that substance. So when Paul's sitting there and, he's, and, and, and he already knows that God's done this before, why didn't he just do it again? Because he understood it wasn't a magic, there wasn't a magic song. Now I believe there's two, at least two reasons. I'm going to give you these two reasons. First of all, there was no Silas. Say, Silas must have been important. Not necessarily Silas. It could have been uh, who, who's the who's the guy Tro, Tro, Tromif, Trof, Tromifius? I, I missed that name. The, the guy that got him in trouble could have been him in there with him. Could have been anybody in there with him. That while Paul was Paul was getting discouraged and and and, and the heaviness of that discouragement was lifting on was setting on him. Somebody that was there would have said, "Hey, hey, hey Paul, in the love of Jesus." Something wonderful, wonderful. Oh, and and Paul, Paul's just going, yeah. In the love of Jesus. Remember in, remember in Ephesus when God did this? Remember when he did that? Remember when he did the other? Yeah. And just began lifting one other up on their most holy faith. And again, I don't, I'm not going to talk anymore about that, but we need one another. Iron sharpens iron. Beloved, why do you think the first thing that happens? I, I remember this. I know Steve remembers this too, but um, when, uh, when this is, oof, it's been a long time ago. Um, but but uh, when he was kind of first a part of the body and just, and, and just getting things going, uh, the enemy would make sure on Sunday nights after he got done uh, on his route at Pizza Hut, that he couldn't sleep and he would stay awake all night long and he could try to lay down and sleep and couldn't sleep except except about eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning just before it was time to go to church. Because the enemy wants, he wants in the night, he wants to wear you out so you're separated from the people that need that you need to be around. We need one another. And, and, and Paul was there by himself. So I simply put this, that is why one of the enemy's first efforts is to remove you from your covenant partners. Keep you at home. Keep you too busy. Number two, and I believe this is, this is, um, this is what was going on. This, this is why it was different than the first time. Is, and I'll just simply say all the words that had been spoken to him. And I know I've already said it tonight, but again, those words of tr people trying to discourage what God was wanting to do for that person. And I'm not going to get into that anymore. Um, but let, let, me, let me just simply say this. Five times in Scripture, in the New Testament, the term be of good cheer is used. All five times it was by Jesus slash God here. Jesus spoke it four times in the Gospels. This is the only other time. And it was the Lord standing by him at night saying, be of good cheer. Now, I want, here's what I want, to, I want to show you here is this. Some of y'all going, be of good cheer because I'm going to knock down. I'm going to knock down those guards. You're going to be delivered. You're going to, you know, because he's already done that once, right? Be of good cheer because all your problems are going away, right? Oh, Lord, he had no idea what was getting ready to come. In, in, in the next, next week, we'll talk about this. They were getting ready to go on a hunger strike until Paul was killed. Um, and they were, going to, they were going to, they planned it. They planned how they're going to do it. And they were like, we're not eating again until 
which again, they lied because I'm sure they all ate. Verse chapter 24, he, uh, the last, last verse, uh, go 24, 27. Verse 27. Because notice here, uh, very last verse in, in chapter 24, it says, but after two years of him just sitting there in prison, he came to Felix's room and they turned him over to the Jews. <laughs> two years, he's in there doing nothing but not, well, whatever he is doing. Two years. And then released to the Jews, the lunatics who put him in there in the first place. Chapter 25, beginning of chapter 25, another plot to kill him. And then chapter 27 starts his cruise to Rome. But in John chapter 16, verse 33, he says, These things I've spoken to you, that you might have peace, shalom. In the world, you're going to have some situations that are not going to line up with perfect, perfectness. You're going to have battles. You're going to have things come up. Listen, folks, I'm telling you what. Last two years have been frustrating. They have not been how I imagined last two years would have ever been. I assume by now that that we would have um, we would have the, a mega church. I assumed, and I ain't sad about where I'm not sad about where we're at. I, I know I know God's still building, God's still bringing. Um, he's He's refreshing the purpose on us. Um, but I didn't assume that 20 years into this that 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 we'd still be. Believe in God for increase. But in the world, you're going to have the enemy rise up against you. He's going to, have, he's going to come at you with symptoms. He's going to come at you with lies. He's going to come at you with attacks. He's going to come at you with unexpected things. But be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. For I have overcome those lies. He may come at you with sickness. Jesus overcame that sickness. He may come at you with lies. The word is greater than those lies. He may come at you with financial difficulty. Jesus, for our sake, became poor that we could become rich on the cross. Be of good cheer. Not, 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 when the, not when it's over. In the middle of it. I was thinking of the scripture that says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You know what, I, I, you know what we sometimes fail to recall or notice in that scripture? Is that there's weapons that will be formed against us. It didn't say there will be no weapon formed against you. No, it says that when, when they are formed, they can't prosper. And so what Jesus was saying, what, what God was saying to him in that room, he said, here, I'm with you. I'm right here with you. And I got some good news for you. And I guarantee you over the next two, three, four years, whatever it was, through, through his imprisonment, even through Rome, the whole time through there, Paul would sit there and say, I've got to stand before Caesar. I've got to go to Rome and spread the gospel. I'm not in Rome. I haven't been to Rome. So this has yet to come to pass. And so I will stand. I know this is not my end. I know this is not where it, where it stops. I've got to keep going. I've got to keep fighting. I cannot let the enemy take me out here. Take me out now. I've got more to, to take care of. It was the word. Be of good cheer. Beloved, I don't know what you're going through tonight. God has a plan for you. He has a word for you. He has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you. He has giftings and callings that have got to come to pass. And the only way they won't is if you quit. 
is if you stop short, is if you lose your joy. If the devil can't steal your joy, you can't have your goods. Amen. So again, I, I don't know where, what kind of darkness you've been in. I don't know what lies the enemy's told you. Recognize they are lies. You are more than a conqueror. And it's impossible for you to fail if you don't quit. Amen? Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. <sighs> Weather outside's got to get more consistent so we can keep it in here more consistent. In the mornings and through the days, it stays really cool in here. Um, it was 66 degrees in here, but it was chilly in here. I knew my wife would be upset that it was so chilly in here. And so on the way out, I set it to 68. Just two degrees up just to kick it on to where it would do something. It's hot in here. Amen. Amen. God's not done with you. Matter of fact, for many of us, um, he's only just begun. Amen. So, so, so stay in there. Stay strong. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I just encourage us tonight. Encourage every person in this room. I don't know what kind of darkness they've been in the middle of. Um, I, I'm guessing they've been in the middle of some. But whatever lie the enemy's been throwing at them, in Jesus' name right now, Father, I command those lies to fail. And, and, I, and I command joy. to bubble up inside of them. Let them recognize the lie so they can rejoice in the Word. We love you, Dad. In Jesus' name.